Welcome to everybody. We're thrilled to have you here. Uh, a couple of things. So uh, as you can see at the back of the room, there are our books that'll be for sale uh, at the end of the night. So it'd be a great opportunity for you to purchase a book. And also Barbara and Rick have agreed to stick around and sign uh, books. So uh, so I encourage you to do that. Um, I also want to acknowledge the sponsors for tonight's event. Uh, again, thanks to the Cache Valley Historical Society who's been a great partner uh, on this. And uh, in addition, this event is sponsored by the USU History Department and Religious Studies Program, the Leonard J. Arrington Chair of Mormon History and Culture, and all of the many individuals, and I know that includes some of you here, who have made generous contributions to the, to the program, to the university, uh, to the chair over the years that make it possible for us to hold events like this and make them free and open to the public. So thanks to each of you. So it's my pleasure to, to introduce two good friends and, and colleagues. Um, uh, and so I'll uh, introduce them each in turn, and then we'll get to the main event. So Barbara Jones Brown is the director of Signature Books, which for more than four decades has been one of the most significant publishers of scholarship in Mormon history and Mormon studies. Prior to that, she served as historical director of Better Days 2020, a nonprofit dedicated to commemorating and educating Utahns about the history of women's suffrage in the state. And then she became executive director of the Mormon History Association. And there I was very privileged to work with her very closely and to see her professionalism, her collegiality, her outreach as the day-to-day -day leader of that organization, which is the most important scholarly organization for Mormon history. Brown earned, earned her degrees in journalism and history from Brigham Young University and the University of Utah. We can forgive her uh, for, for that. Uh, and in addition to her organizational and intellectual leadership, she's also she was the content editor for the award-winning book Massacre at Mountain Meadows, which was the prequel to this one, and now co-author of this book that they'll be talking about tonight, Vengeance is Mine, The Mountain Meadows Massacre and Its Aftermath. And her partner in crime is Richard Turley Jr. I think it's uh, no exaggeration to say that Rick is one of the most important figures in the modern era of historical scholarship by and about the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. He earned his degrees from Brigham Young University, including a JD from the J. Reuben Clark Law School, for which he also can be forgiven. Uh, soon after graduating with his law degree, he was hired as assistant managing director of the church historical department, where he remained for most of his career. He served for many years as the assistant church historian of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, and in 2016 became managing director of the church's public affairs department. It's been well documented that under his leadership, the church's historical efforts moved toward unprecedented professionalization, productivity, and transparency. These have always been the hallmarks of Rick's scholarship as well. He's the author or co-author of numerous books, including Victims, the LDS Church, and the Mark Hoffman case, which made him a huge Netflix star uh, on, the, on, on the documentary uh, Murder Among the Mormons, uh, Massacre at Mountain Meadows, which I already mentioned, and now with Barbara, Vengeance is Mine. Uh, and just on a personal note, I want to express my gratitude for, for Rick and Barbara uh, coming up and, and doing this, fitting it in. They've got a very busy speaking schedule and fishing schedule uh, the, the, that they fit this in, especially so close to the anniversary of the massacre, which, was, which of course, was two days ago. But even more than that, um, these are two of the people whom I admire most uh, within the field of Mormon history, friends and colleagues um, whose work I just... Um, uh, respect enormously now that they've become trusted friends. So, so please join me in offering a warm Aggie welcome to Barbara Jones Brown and Rick Turley. So while Patrick's getting this set up, I just want to say, um, how I always love coming to Logan. Um, Patrick didn't mention he was the one who hired me to be executive director of the Mormon history association. He was president at the time. So I, I owe that to Patrick. Um, and then recently we planned MHA's annual conference here in Logan. And while coming up to Logan to plan this, I made many dear friends up here. And I see a lot of you in the audience. Thank you for coming tonight. It means so much to me. Um, also, my ancestors are from Logan. This is kind of my ancestral homeland. Uh, my ancestors are Peter and Elizabeth Mon, some of the first settler, settlers here, uh, Hezekiah and um, Allie Kitchen Thatcher. And um, 
Mary, Mon, Howell, and Joseph Howell. So, and all their homes are still here. So I, I do feel like I'm kind of coming home when I come up to Logan. I also want to acknowledge that, of course, this is the ancestral homelands of the Northwestern Shoshone people as well. Okay, so on September 11th, 1857, a group of Mormon settlers in Southwest Utah used false promises of protection to coax a party of California-bound emigrants from their encircled wagons and massacre them. The slaughter left the corpses of some 100 men, women, and children strewn across a highland valley called the Mountain Meadows. Almost immediately after the atro atrocity, both non-Mormons and Latter-day Saints not involved in the atrocity began speculating about the motive behind it. On the non-Mormon side, after word of the massacre reached Southern California within a few weeks of the crime, the Los Angeles Star reported that, quote, a general belief pervades the public mind here that the Indians were instigated to this crime by the destroying angels of the church and that the blow fell on these emigrants from Arkansas in retribution for the death of Apostle Parley P. Pratt, which took place in that state in May 1857. Right the there, Star's Duke. editors acknowledge that the truth of the matter will not be known until the government make an investigation of the affair. This speculation about a motive took hold and was propagated for generations, including in Will Bagley's 2002 book, Blood of the Prophets. By the way, this happens to be uh, the 1877 lithograph that was used for the cover of, of Will's book. And it was also this, this theory about... Uh, the massacre being in retribution for Parley P. Pratt's murder is also uh, continued in John Krakauer's 2004 book and recent miniseries, Under the Banner of Heaven. This interpretation of motive maintains that it was religious belief or religious fanaticism that led Mormons to commit the massacre. So on the other hand, Latter-day Saints who did not participate in the massacre quickly latched on to a rumored motive that miscreant emigrants had poisoned an ox and spring at the Corn Creek campground in central Utah, and that they had been attacked by the Indians in revenge for the poisoning. This interpretation of motive by Latter-day Saints relies on racialized 19th century stereotypes of indigenous peoples as savages and and this uh, lithograph portrays that done in 1877. You can see in the bottom right-hand corner these images of savage uh, Indians creeping up on this wagon train. Um, so that interpretation came from the Latter-day Saints, and um, they think that uh, the Gentiles were also eager to persecute and kill Mormons and Indians. So a close examination of events that took place after the massacre debunks both of these speculative motives. First, of the many justifications and reasons that perpetrators and other Mormons gave for the massacre, not one of them mentioned Parley P. Pratt's murder as a motive. And I'm going to see if my slides are working here. They are not. <laughs> Oh, no, they are working. Okay. Perhaps most telling was a statement given by massacre leader John D. Lee during his 1875 trial. Some court watchers thought that Lee's written confession, through which he attempted to avoid prosecution by turning state's evidence and becoming a witness for the prosecution, would support the nearly 20-year-old theory that, quote, the massacre was instigated by Brigham Young as a means of revenge upon the people of Arkansas for the murder of Pratt in Arkansas. Instead, Lee said nothing about Pratt and implicated only his fellow Southern Utah co-conspirators for planning and carrying out the massacre. As for the poisoning motive, in 1859, Young's replacement as Utah's superintendent of Indian Affairs, Jacob Forney, investigated the supposed poisoning at Corn Creek. Corn Creek is near Fillmore. Forney concluded that while some Pavan Indians had in fact died from eating oh. a dead ox the Arkansas emigrants had given them at Corn Creek, this did not lead them to participate in the massacre. Quote, I have not been apprised that this excited any of them against the emigrants, Forney wrote. 
And after strict inquiry, I cannot learn that even one Pava Indian was present at the massacre. That's it. Orny surmised that the ox must have eaten a poisonous weed, then died while the Arkansas train was camped at Corn Creek. With no understanding of germ theory in mid 19th century America, people could only guess what caused the mysterious illness and deaths of cattle and people. Along the trail from Utah to Southern California during the mid to late 1850s, people died or became seriously ill after handling cattle carcasses. After reviewing the circumstances and symptoms in documented cases from the 1850s, modern medical experts concluded that anthrax, a naturally occurring disease borne by cattle and passed to humans, was the likely culprit. Though Forney was wrong about a poisonous weed being the cause of the Corn Creek deaths, he was right when he concluded that some used the incident to shift motive and blame from the actual massacre perpetrators to Indians and even to the massacre victims themselves. So now that we've traced and debunked these two early speculative motives from both sides of the massacre, Let's look at a previously undefined and politically motivated one brought to the surface by a closer examination of other events that took place after the massacre. On or about October 3rd, 1857, LDS Indian missionaries from southwestern Utah led Moapa Indians in raiding the cattle of a California bound emigrant company called the Duke's Train in the desert southwest of the mountain meadows. So down here in the corner at the bottom where it says big wash, this raid of emigrant cattle took place on October 3rd, 1857. And some of the uh, Indian missionaries who participated in this and leading uh, local Indians in carrying out this raid had just participated in the mountain meadows massacre just a few weeks before. Though no one was hurt in this assault, at least one of these missionaries had just participated, and that was actually Juanita Brooks's grandfather, Dudley Levitt. So this combined Duke's train of emigrants from Missouri, Texas, and Arkansas had already come under attack twice before on September 8th, 1857 in Beaver, Utah, and again on its outskirts. So if you look and the, the way that we indicate where these attacks took place is with the, the kind of the stars. So near Beaver, and um, just outside of Corn Creek, they came under attack. And in fact, they were besieged and corralled at the same time that the emigrants slaughtered at Massacre in Mountain Meadows or at the Mountain Meadows were also besieged simultaneously. So this combined group of three smaller trains had corralled their wagons, dug pits inside for self-defense and made preparations for a fight. A native leader called Ammon, recently returned from meeting Brigham Young in Salt Lake City, came to the camp with Beaver's Bishop, Philo T. Farnsworth, to negotiate an end to the standoff. All was peace, Ammon said, then demanded livestock. After turning over six head of cattle and a horse, the combined Duke's train was able to continue its journey. And about the same time in northern Utah, not far from where we're sitting here tonight, yet another company of emigrants came under attack at two different sites on the northern route to California. So you can see the trails. It came into Salt Lake City and emigrants could either take the southern route to California or head north out of Salt Lake City and take the northern route to northern California and to um, the Oregon Territory. So if you look up at the City of Rocks and Warm Springs, two more attacks took place there during the same days. We were suddenly aroused by the firing of guns and the yelling of the invaders, an emigrant on the Northern Route recorded on September 9th. The raiders ran between the emigrants' camp and their herd in the darkness, firing about 15 or 16 gunshots and yelling at a considerable rate, the emigrant said. The intention of them was without doubt to stampede our stock, not to kill any cattle or any person, but simply to steal as many as they could. 
In the morning, when the emigrants saw tracks of shod horses and one or two pairs of boots, they concluded that at least some of the raiders were white men. They were attacked again a second time on September 10th. On September 12th, Apostle George A. Smith wrote Parowan State President William H. Dane that Shoshone had stolen a host of cattle from passing emigrants. Finally, non-Mormon merchant William Bell's company was the last known to pass through the territory in the fall of 1857, leaving Salt Lake City for California on November 8th. Having learned in late September of the horror of the Mountain Meadows Massacre, Brigham Young wrote to Southern Utah requesting that Southern Indian Mission President Jacob Hamlin guide this company through. I wish Mr. Bell and company to pass safely to San Bernardino with all their effects, Young made clear. When the Bell company neared the area where the Duke's company had been raided on October 3rd, Hamlin rode out ahead. At the Muddy River in what is today Nevada, he met two Mormon Indian missionaries who had recently come there from Cedar City. Hamlin had trouble convincing them that the approaching Bell Company should not be attacked. A plan had been laid and matured in their minds to kill off this company and take the spoil, Hamlin said. I told them I had instructions from Governor Young, but they held the idea out to me that there were secret instructions that I knew nothing of. Hamlin wrote that he only narrowly avoided this contemplated attack on the Bell Company. The multiple attacks and near attack on various emigrant companies in the fall of 1857 make clear that the company massacred at the Mountain Meadows was not the only one targeted. So why the multiple attacks on mul multiple trains at multiple locations in Utah? The answer lies in an examination of the context and contemporary sources, which I'll explain now. In early summer, 1857, believing Utah territory to be in a state of substantial rebellion, President James Buchanan had sent U.S. troops and a new governor and superintendent of Indian Affairs to replace Brigham Young in those capacities. Hearing that 2,500 troops were destined for Utah and receiving no explanation from Buchanan, the Saints feared the army was coming to drive or destroy them, or at best threaten the independence they sought in Utah. The distress of Missouri and Illinois was still raw in their minds, as were more recent rumors that federal troops would someday come to drive the Saints from the now developed Salt Lake Valley. While Utah would accept his replacement and the other new appointees if, quote, they would behave themselves, Young said, he and his advisors devised strategies to keep the troops out and persuade Washington to pull them back. First, Mormon militiamen would slow the Army's approach by intercepting their supply trains and burning the prairie grass their animals needed to survive. If the Mormons could keep the troops from entering Utah settlements before snow stalled them on the plains, Young reasoned, he and his people could buy time until the American public and Congress might turn against Buchanan's decision to send an army to occupy Utah. Second, if the troops did make it through, the saints would lay their settlements in ashes and flee to the mountains or some other remote region. A third element of Young's resistance strategy involved Native people. As Utah's superintendent of Indian Affairs, Young had frequently mediated disputes between emigrant parties and local Indians prior to August 1857. When conflicts broke out, interpreters distributed food and gifts to conciliate Indians. But as federal troops approached Utah, Young decided to no longer do so. He first alluded to this new policy, to this policy change in his August 11th, 1857 diary, saying that, quote, unless the government assumes a more pacific attitude toward Utah, he would declare emigration by the overland route stopped. Based on 19th century racial stereotypes, Young surmised that emigrants' fears of 
Indian cattle raiding would stop the Western emigration, then so crucial to the expansionist goals of the United States. Young and his advisors believed that the Mormons' strategic position astride America's transcontinental emigration routes gave them their best leverage in negotiating with Washington, D.C. to keep federal troops out of Utah. Young publicly laid these resistance strategies out the following Sunday, August 16th, when thousands of Latter-day Saints, non-Mormons, and newspaper reporters packed Salt Lake's Bowery to hear his regular Sabbath day address. He spoke of how he had heretofore endeavored to keep the trails through Utah safe for emigration, declaring that Mormon influence prevented Indians from robbing or killing emigrants. But now, quote, if the United States send their army here, cross-continental travel must cease, he vowed. If the United States armies come, Young told his audience, then write to your friends, don't pretend to cross this continent. I will not hold the Indians still while you shoot them as you have hitherto, but I will say to them, go and do as you please. Young wanted his strategies widely circulated. Report it, he urged newspaper reporters in the audience. Publish this abroad. Though publicly, Young declared he would no longer hold the Indians back, privately, his interpreter, Dimmick Huntington, encouraged local tribes to participate in raiding emigrant livestock. On August 11th, the same day that Young recorded this policy change in his journal, Huntington surprised a Shoshone leader nearby here in northern Utah when he told him that Young did not disapprove of the band's recent raid of emigrant stock. At the end of August, Young again sent Huntington north to meet with the Shoshone. There, Huntington wrote that he gave them all the beef cattle and horses that was on the road to California, the northern route, encouraging them to raid emigrant livestock and drive it into the mountains. Surprised at the Mormon leader's about face teaching, some Shoshone replied that this was something new and they wanted to counsel and think about it. Others told Huntington to tell Brother Brigham that we are his friends and that he can depend on us. A day or two later on September 1st, about a dozen Pavan and Paiute Indians of central and southwestern Utah brought to Salt Lake by Southern Indian Mission President Jacob Hamlin, met with Young and Huntington in Young's office. In that meeting, Huntington gave them all the cattle that had gone to California, the Southern route. These are direct quotes from Huntington's journal for that day. The Indians opened their eyes wide in surprise, responding, you've told us not to steal. So I have, Huntington answered, but now they, the Americans, meaning the army, have come to fight us. So things have changed. As I earlier described, in just three and a half weeks between September 7th and October 3rd, 1857, several attacks took place on ad emigrant cattle companies in Utah ter Territory, and another was narrowly avoided in November. Only one resulted in a massacre. After an initial September 7th attack on the company at Mountain Meadows did not go as planned, several emigrants were killed and the emigrants encircled their wagons and dug in. Cedar City State President Isaac Haight sent an express to Young asking what to do about the, the besieged emigrants. Young replied on September 10th in a letter, in regard to emigration trains passing through our settlements, you must not meddle with them. The Indians we expect will do as they please. If those who are there, meaning the emigrants, will leave, let them go in peace. But Young's letter arrived in Cedar City too late, and there lies the uh, and the Southern Utah leaders had already decided they could not let before Young's letter arrived. They could not let these emigrants go on because they would spread word in California that Mormons were involved in these cattle raids and that some of their number had been murdered by them. So this botched raid led these Southern Utah leaders to orchestrate the massacre of all these witnesses old enough to tell tales as a cover-up 
of white Mormons' involvement and to saddle the blame solely on the local Paiute people. Hoping to persuade Washington to pull back the troops, Young again warned of Indian aggression toward emigrants and, and the army in a letter to the U.S. Commissioner of Indian Affairs. The sound of war quickens the blood and nerves of an Indian, Young alleged, playing again on these stereotypes. The report that troops were wending their way to this territory has had its influence upon them. In one or two instances, this was the reason assigned why they made the attacks which they did upon some herds of cattle. They seemed to think if it was to be war, they might as well commence and begin to lay in a supply of food, he wrote. If Washington would only heed his advice, Young urged, travelers could again pass through Utah and no Indian would disturb or molest them. I tell them not to raid, to cease their contentions and shedding of blood, but I can hold them no longer. If the president of the United States did not respect the saints' rights, travel will be stopped across the continent. The deserts of Utah become a battleground for freedom. It's peace and our rights or the knife and tomahawk. Let Uncle Sam choose. Again, that's the letter he wrote home to, or to Washington, D.C., to his superior. Two and a half weeks later, on September 29th, John D. Lee visited Young in Salt Lake City to report the massacre. And when Lee arrives in his office, Young has the assistant church historian, a young man at the time named Wilfred Woodruff, join him in the office to hear Lee's report, and Young recorded it that night in his journal. So as one of its ringleaders, Lee knew the truth about the crime, but lied about it in an effort to cover it up to Young, blaming it entirely on Indians and on the emigrants' behavior, including their supposed poisoning of a, string, of a spring. Shocked, Young interrupted Lee's chilling account. Despite Lee's many accusations, which were false against the emigrants, Young said the story of their slaughter was heartrending and that, quote, emigration must stop, as he had before said. Young left his office at 11 a.m. feeling sick about what he had just heard. He may have recognized that perhaps his strategy had not intended to lead to a massacre or to any killing, but perhaps this policy had led to this occurring. From that point on, Young's efforts to engage Indians in raiding immigrant cattle and fighting U.S. Troop, troops ceased. In conclusion, it was not religious belief or fanaticism or anti-Mormon aggression by Gentile immigrants or Native American savagery, but political conflict between Utah and the federal government that ultimately resulted in the unintended massacre of innocent men, women, and children. Had the attack on the company at Mountain Meadows not gone murderously awry, Young's wartime cattle raiding strategy might have gone largely forgotten. Instead, the Mountain Meadows massacre would haunt Young, his legacy, and his people for generations. Sadly, the Mountain Meadows Massacre may never have been prosecuted if it hadn't held political value for the federal appointees who controlled Utah's legal system in the decades after the Civil War. Under the spoil system that existed in the 19th century, friends of victorious politicians who received appointments to offices in America's territories expected their new positions would give them political and economic control of their new jurisdictions, leading to fame and riches. But that was not necessarily true in Utah Territory, where the majority of citizens voted as a block for candidates endorsed by Latter-day Saint leaders. For years before 1869, when the Transcontinental Railroad brought streams of people easily to the territory, federal appointees to offices in Utah Territory tried to figure out how to undercut the power of Brigham Young and the majority Latter-day Saint population. By the early 1870s, these politicians within Utah's non-Mormon Liberal Party came up with the bold idea of disenfranchising devout Latter-day Saints, allowing the minority population Liberal Party members to control the territory politically and economically. But getting Congress to disenfranchise the majority population of a territory 
that had enjoyed the right to vote since its formation was a hard sell. Still, led by lawyer Robert Baskin, Liberal Party lobbyists tried using sex and violence, two topics sure to garner publicity, as their rationale. Sex in this case meant polygamy, a titillating topic to people of that day. Violence meant the Mountain Meadows Massacre and other Utah examples of extra legal crime, much of it occurring in the late in the 1850s, especially in the context of the so-called Reformation and the Utah War. The Liberal Party lobbyists hoped the year 1874 would finally bring the hoped for legislation that would lead to their control of Utah territory. Their lobbying efforts led to Congress's passage of the Poland Act, an important bill that made it easier to prosecute the perpetrators of the Mountain Meadows Massacre. But to the disappointment of those seeking to wrest control of Utah territory, Congress refused to deprive Latter-day Saints of the right to vote and to serve on juries in Utah. Some in Congress, however, promised that if the Poland Act proved insufficient, they might entertain a tougher bill in the future. In September 1874, Judge Jacob S. Borman of Utah's second district held the first court under the Poland Act. Under this watered down bill, Borman's initial grand jury was a mixture of Latter-day Saints and non-Mormons. You are part on one side and part on the other, Borman told his jurors. If you do not do your duty as you have solemnly sworn to do, he warned, it will only give cause for further legislation and a much more rigorous law will be enacted. The mixed jury with these instructions secretly handed down indictments of nine persons for their roles in the massacre. The nine included massacre kingpins Isaac C. Haight, William Dame, John D. Lee, John M. Higby, and Philip Klingensmith. The other four were George Adair, Ellet Wilden, Samuel Jukes, and William Stewart. Eventually, five of the nine suspects were taken into custody, including Dame, Lee, and Klingensmith. How was it then that only John D. Lee was prosecuted and executed for his role in the massacre? Longstanding mythology asserts that Brigham Young decided to make John D. Lee the fall guy scapegoating him in a base deal with a district attorney, provided no one else was ever prosecuted, and that Lee's conviction would spell the end of the investigation. Elements of this mythology have persisted for generations, largely because people haven't examined and properly analyzed the legal documents pertaining to the case. That was in part because no one had gathered the documents that make up this legal puzzle and made them readily accessible. In 2017, Janice Johnson, Lejean Purcell Carruth, and I published the weighty, and I mean weighty, two volume set Mountain Meadows Massacre collected legal papers through the University of Oklahoma Press. This monumental publication was the culmination of many years and tens of thousands of hours of work by numerous colleagues that is reflected not only in the two print volumes, but also thousands of other pages that are made available online at mountainmeadowsmassacre.org. Barbara and I relied on these volumes and other sources in our recently published Vengeance is Mine. How well does the mythology of John D. Lee's prosecution hold up to the legal evidence? Not very well at all. Let's compare mythology and evidence one piece at a time. How did John D. Lee end up being prosecuted? It turns out that Brigham Young had nothing to do with selecting John D. Lee as the person to be prosecuted. The September 1874 grand jury indicted nine persons and marshals ended up arresting five, as I mentioned earlier. The most important of the five were William Dame, the senior military leader in Southern Utah and the highest person who authorized the massacre. John D. Lee, the man who promised safety to the massacred immigrants under a white flag, and then helped to kill them, and Philip Clingham Smith, a massacre participant who transported and distributed the children whose parents he helped to murder. Ideally, prosecutors wanted to go after Dame. 
Dame, besides being a senior military leader and the man who authorized the massacre, was also a stake president, the highest ranking Latter-day Saint leader in custody, a fact that appealed to liberal party leaders hoping to disenfranchise the saints. In going after Dame, prosecutors used what has become the standard approach to breaking up a conspiracy, which is getting the small fish caught in the law enforcement dragnet to cop on the big fish. Philip Klingensmith, also circled here, had already agreed to turn state's evidence before being formally arrested. He had filed an affidavit years earlier in Nevada, becoming the first massacre participant to sign a legal document admitting at least some degree of guilt in the atrocity. Yet his affidavit was weak in many respects and did not provide prosecutors all they needed to convict Dane. Lee, there in the lower left-hand corner, Lee, they thought, might be able to help out. Prosecutors offered Lee a plea deal. If he supplied them with an adequate confession, they would let him walk as well. Though prosecutors didn't define what they meant by satisfactory confession, they were clearly looking for evidence that at a minimum would convict Dame and perhaps even give them political ammunition to aim at bigger targets like Brigham Young or George A. Smith. Lee consulted with his lawyer about the, offers, the offer from the prosecutors and his counsel, aware of the strong evidence against their client, advised him to accept the offer feeling it was about as good a deal as he could possibly expect. Lee sat down to write what turned out to be a rather thin confession, one that did not give prosecutors what they needed to convict Dame or anyone else in custody. Prosecutors couldn't try Klingensmith because they had already bargained to free him. Among the key leaders in custody, that left only Lee, who was a popular target in any case because he had become the poster boy of the massacre for one primary reason. He talked about it a lot over time to many people. Lee loved to talk, a feature elevated when he drank alcohol. He may have talked more publicly about the massacre than the other 50 or 60 perpetrators combined, though he consistently deflected the responsibility he deserved. When prosecutors turned on Lee, he and his legal counsel felt double-crossed. They felt it was unfair to prosecute him using evidence he supplied for prosecuting others. The disappointment of Lee and his lawyers, however, had everything to do with what Lee refused to tell prosecutors and nothing at all to do with decisions of Brigham Young, contrary to the myth. Next, what happened in the first John D. Lee trial? Mythology, reflected in some books on the massacre, asserts that John D. Lee's first trial was a battle between Latter-day Saints who wanted Lee freed and prosecutors who wanted him convicted. In some versions of the tale, Brigham Young and other church leaders hover somewhere in the background, providing support and encouragement to jurors responsible for hearing the evidence and deciding Lee's fate. The evidence provides a much different picture. It turns out that prosecutors did not want Lee convicted in the first trial. Rather than make a serious effort to try him, they elected instead to throw the first trial for political reasons. You can read the details in our book, Vengeance is Mine, but to put it simply, they didn't want Lee convicted because that would undercut their political argument that Latter-day Saints were not capable of governing themselves. Instead, prosecutors wanted a hung jury so they could go back to Congress and order and argue that the saints were unworthy of self-government since they couldn't even convict a murder in their midst. In other words, they were going to try to get that harsher legislation that some in Congress had promised them if the Poland Act did not work. After throwing the first trial in 1875, the Liberal Party lobbyists did just that. They again went to Congress and again tried to get Congress to pass legislation tougher than the Poland Act. They not only failed, but Washington replaced prosecutor lobbyist Robert Baskin with a new federal attorney, Sumner Howard, who did not have a political dog in the fight and concentrated on performing his assigned duties as district attorney, which included seeking to convict criminals 
especially those guilty of the greatest crimes in his assigned territory. Which brings us to Lee's second trial, this one held in 1876. Question. Did Brigham Young agree with Sumner Howard to help prosecute Lee if he ended the prosecutions there? Since 1859, Brigham Young had encouraged federal officials to prosecute the perpetrators of the massacre, offering to lend his influence in assuring that the suspects were brought to trial and that witnesses testified at the proceedings. For political reasons, which we outline in detail in Vengeance is Mine, key federal officials repeatedly rejected his efforts. But when Washington sent prosecutor Sumner Howard to Utah, he accepted Young's offer, the first federal lawyer to do so. Howard went after Lee and Young fulfilled his promise to use his influence to get witnesses into court. Working through one of his counselors, he summoned Latter-day Saint witnesses who participated in the massacre or witnessed its aftermath. They testified against Lee and the jury made up entirely of Latter-day Saints found him guilty, which he unquestionably was. But wasn't there a deal with the prosecutor to end his prosecutions with Lee? No, the evidence shows quite the contrary. Sumner Howard and Judge Jacob Borman continued to seek convictions. The deaths of Brigham Young and George A. Smith, however, reduced the political value of going after the massacre's perpetrators. Young died just a few months after Lee's execution and George A. Smith died in 1875, the year of the first trial. I now quote from one of the final chapters of Vengeance is Mine. Because Young's and George A. Smith's deaths had diminished the political value of the case, liberal party members' desire to pursue and prosecute the fugitives also waned. Instead, Robert Baskin and other party members finally achieved their goal of disenfranchising Mormons, not by focusing on the massacre, but through anti-polygamy legislation. The 1887 Edmonds-Tucker Act replaced local judges sympathetic to polygamy with federally appointed ones, disenfranchised Utah women of the suffrage rights they had exercised since 1870, and prohibited all men who would not sign an anti-polygamy oath from voting and serving as jurors or public officials. The legislation led to the Liberal Party's clean sweep of, the Salt, of Salt Lake City's February 1890 elections. Liberal candidates took all council races and for the first time, the capital city had a non-Mormon mayor. Wilford Woodruff, who became Latter-day Saint president in 1899, issued a manifesto in October of 1890, eventually, excuse me, September, eventually ending the, the practice of plural marriage among the church's faithful. Robert Baskin was elected Salt Lake City's mayor two years later. By instituting municipal improvements, including cleaner water, he won the respect of Latter-day Saints. The man who had been their chief nemesis became a renowned leader of their church's headquarters city and later chief justice of the Utah Supreme Court. He joined church leaders in publicly celebrating the centennial of Brigham Young's birth in 1901. The assembled throng greeted him with uproarious applause. It gives me pleasure to be present on this memorable occasion, Baskin said. The fact that I have been asked to make a speech is the best evidence that conditions have changed and I think for the better. If we go back 25 years ago, we find wormwood in the mouths of both sides, he admitted. But that wormwood has been taken out and now we meet each other as brothers. Although I differed with Brigham Young, Baskin recalled with considerable understatement, I think he possessed qualities that no other man ever had. It was his power over men and his great common sense. He was not great in classical learning, but brought his people together from all nations. If Mormonism has the elements of perpetuity, perpetuity proclaimed the man who previously fought the faith, it will survive all opposition and commend itself more than it does today. If it stands the test, it will come out brighter because of the opposition. When Baskin died in 1918, the Deseret News observed, the news and the judge, having learned something from experience, this paper found itself able conscientiously to support him for high public office and to command his official acts and policies. Going back now to the 1870s, we can discover from the evidence 
that when Sumner Howard accepted Brigham Young's longstanding offer to prosecute, to provide witnesses for Lee's second trial, and especially after Lee was convicted in that trial, both Lee and his legal counsel, William Bishop, were once again upset at prosecutors. Because Brigham Young had cooperated with the prosecution, Lee and Bishop also transferred some of that anger to him. Lee's correspondence from the period shows he was angry at Young for supplying witnesses, and he was especially angry at his co-conspirators for turning on him. Lee's lawyer, William Bishop, was poorly prepared for Lee's second trial and humiliated to lose one of the most important legal proceedings of his career, one he overconfidently assumed would end in a hung jury just as the first had. Another myth that has been perpetuated for decades, even in books published recently by university presses, is the notion that Brigham Young tampered with the jury in the second trial. These myths originate with an angry John D. Lee, anger that passed down through family members and became part of their efforts to try to rehabilitate their ancestors' reputation. Some of the most outrageous stories arising from this anger come from very late family sources but continue to appear in seemingly respectable books. One relatively recent book on the massacre relates the following, quote, Amaralee Smithson learned of the plan to sacrifice her father when she crawled up to a bonfire out in the brush where Daniel H. Wells, Brigham Young's counselor, was meeting with local authorities. Frankly recalled that each designated juror had a star pinned under arm so it would be known whom to choose for the jury. The idea that Daniel Wells had to meet with church leaders at a bonfire out in the brush instead of in one of the local leaders' houses, strange credulity, as does the idea that a child would be out there in the first place and then somehow slip up to that same bonfire unnoticed. Even more implausible is the idea of a star pinned in prospective jurors' armpits. Surely if there were a conspiracy afoot to control jury selection, the conspirators could come up with an easier and more discreet way to identify prospective jurors than pinning stars in their armpits. Besides, the image of potential jurors flapping their arms like chickens to flash pinned letters to attorneys would surely attract unwanted attention. Now let's compare this mythology with the real evidence. Again, I quote from Vengeance is Mine. Lee gave his own explanation. The jury was selected also and instructed to bring a verdict of guilty in the first degree, he wrote his wife, Rachel, claiming that the names of each juryman on the list was marked with an X and some with two, and that leading men in the church told my attorney, W.W. Bishop, to select the jury from the names that were marked, promising him that if he would do so, that jury would acquit me. Lee's memoirs, posthumously edited and published by his embittered lawyer, William Bishop, echo these claims. The defense attorneys, he claimed in the book, had been furnished a list of the jurymen, and the list was examined by a committee of Mormons. The unnamed committee marked potential jurors who would convict with a dash, those who would prefer not to convict with a star, and those who would certainly acquit with two stars. Lee's attorneys selected jurymen who were marked with the two stars in the list. Bishop charged that the Mormons who gave us the list so marked had shown it to Howard before they gave it to us and informed him that he had nothing to fear. Depending on the accuracy of the details, what Lee and Bishop described was either normal jury selection or illegal jury tampering. Trial lawyers always try to pick jurors sympathetic to their positions. It would not have been illegal for both the prosecution and the defense in Lee's case to seek opinions about how potential jurors might vote. But it would be illegal for jurors to commit in advance to vote a specific way. Bishop's actions in the immediate wake of the trial suggest there was no jury tampering. When Prosecutor Sumner Howard was accused of malfeasance in dealing with Lee and his confession, Bishop announced that he considered Howard an honest, efficient man in every respect, and admitted that he was fairly beaten by Howard, who is justly entitled to the credit of the victory in the trial. When Bishop appealed Lee's conviction to the territorial Supreme Court, he listed numerous reasons that the court should grant his client a new trial. None of them included jury tampering. Finally, evidence about the jury's deliberations weighs against the charge. 
The first jury ballot was seven for first degree murder, four for second degree murder, and one for manslaughter. Hardly a solid unit in rendering a verdict of murder in the first degree as Lee claimed. We can at last lay these myths to rest. The Mountain Meadows Massacre literature, including books published by respectable university presses, are laced with myths repeated by historians who have given them credence because they can cite to an earlier work that contained them. It's time to stop repeating such tales and to rely instead on the solid evidence now so readily available. In conclusion, I strongly encourage you to read our new book, Vengeance is Mine which does more to sort myth from evidence than any previous work on the subject. From those with a deep interest in the legal aspects of the Mountain Meadows case, I also recommend the two-volume set, Mountain Meadows Massacre Collected Legal Papers, as well as the thousands of other pages we have made available online at mountainmeadowsmassacre.org. Finally, I want to thank my co-author, Barbara, for her years of partnering on this project and our many, many colleagues who collectively have donated hundreds of years of research to help us learn and recount what really happened in this famous case. Thank you. Oh, wow. <laughs> so the question is, the question is what we have been doing with um, descendants of the victims, the surviving, the 17 children who survived. Um, gosh, there literally there could be another book written on that subject. Um, Rick and I were just in St. George. We just got back about 48 hours ago from speaking in the St. George Tabernacle. Um, I was able to spend before that quite a bit of time with them. Um, descendants of victims come to St. George and to visit the graves of their ancestors at the Mountain Meadows every other year. And the, every other year they meet in Arkansas. Rick and I have spoken many times at their invitation to their events. We've become dear friends with these, these folks. Again, uh, we could write a whole volume about this, but so much has been done to, to for us to tell us how sorry, tell them how sorry we are for what happened to their ancestors and to preserve and to protect the graves of their ancestors at the Mountain Meadows, the church. Um, Rick and I worked to help um, achieve National Historic Landmark status to protect the Mountain Meadows. And um, also just they want us to tell the truth about the story. And these books that we've done are very forthcoming in absolving their ancestors of any wrongdoing as well. Do you want to add anything? Okay. Next question. So Patrick says that he understands that Brigham Young turned a blind eye to other instances of extra legal violence during the time period, the, the Parish Potter murders and the, the Aiken murders and other kinds of things. What made the difference in the case of Mountain Meadows? 1857 was a, a very unsettled year and often extra legal violence occurs during unsettled times. In our book, we go through these instances of extra legal violence and show Brigham Young's attitude toward them. And in general, I think you're correct in saying that for the most part, once they'd happened, he couldn't do anything about it. I and mean, he did tell one of the widows in the Parish Potter case, if I had been there, I would have stopped it. But there, you know, after the fact, he couldn't do anything about it. In, in the case of uh, an instance that we show happening in the Cedar City area of blood atonement, he tells the he tells Isaac Haight to forgive the people, but then when Isaac Haight goes forward with a blood atonement, then there's nothing you can do about it at that point. So when he writes back, he doesn't say anything about it. So you're right in saying he appears to turn a blind eye to those instances. What made the difference in the case of Mountain Meadows? In the case of Mountain Meadows, John D. Lee reported to him on September 29th, 1857, and lied about what happened. He said it was entirely an Indian massacre. He and his Confederates in the massacre in the Cedar City, Washington, uh, Santa Clara area, they didn't want Young to know that they had on their own, done this horrific act of killing all these people. So they tried to portray it as an Indian massacre. We think in order to make Brigham Young feel guilt that his Indian policy that he announced August 16th was responsible for setting loose a group of Indians that had then massacred an entire group. Over the course of the next two years, Brigham Young heard other information about the massacre. There was a, a hearing that was held in Provo in March of 1859 in which Judge John Cradlebaugh sought to have the Mount Mills Massacre, Parish Potter murders, and other things examined. And then there were other opportunities to prosecute it in 1859. With all of that, Brigham Young began to say, we can't let this continue to hang over the territory. We've got to figure out what genuinely happened. And so at that point, he starts to volunteer. He goes to the federal district attorney at the time, and he says to him, look, 
you have it your way. You do it in federal court, not one of our probate courts. You do it in federal court. All I ask is that you hold the trial close enough to the witnesses that they're not badly inconvenienced in having to come north. So normally it's said, and, and books published on the subject have said that the John Cradlebaugh trial in March of 1859 was completely befuddled by the church. The grand jurors were Latter-day Saints, and there were church leaders behind the scenes manipulating everything, and, I, and he just couldn't get anywhere with it. But what the books don't say that our book points out is there's another opportunity months later in 1859 to try the Mount Meadows perpetrators again. This time, the judge is Judge Eccles, who is decidedly anti-Mormon. The prosecutor in the case is also decidedly anti-Mormon. He's the man who, who helps to found the Valley Tan newspaper later on. And the grand jury is made up entirely of camp followers from Camp Floyd. So all of these things that the books normally say they just didn't have in 1859, they actually did have in 1859. So why didn't they prosecute in 1859 with Brigham Young agreeing to bring all of the witnesses in to do it? The answer, once again, is political. John Phelps, who was a captain with the U.S. Army, wrote in his journal for the time period that when Eccles got back from Washington, he had turned politician. And that what he really wanted to do was run General Brevet General Albert Sidney Johnston as a candidate for president of the United States, trying to get him into office by using the Mormon problem. And therefore, they didn't want to solve the Mormon problem because that was going to be their basis for getting Johnston into, into the presidency. So that's completely new information you'll find only in, a, in our book. I would just add briefly, uh, Brigham Young also says in 1859, when he offers to help prosecutors prosecute, he says, this thing is being thrown off on me. I'm personally, for personal reasons, he says, I'm the one who's being blamed for this and he doesn't want that to happen. So he wants the case tried. It's in his own best interest as well. Okay, uh, we're almost at 10 minutes. Maybe we could take one more question. Yeah, I think that's always like the first question. I mean, that was my first question the first time I heard about Mount Meadows. I think that's a question that many Latter-day Saints who we know that, you know, we have Christ-like teachings in, in our church, right? Um, the answer is looking at the entire context. And the context does not justify or excuse the massacre in any way, but just understanding the context of the time. There's an army approaching. There is war hysteria. They are fearing for their lives. Um, and when the emigrants inside the wagon corral learned that Latter-day Saint settlers are involved in their murders, they say, if we, and we, we quote them, we quote them what they say, and they all say, if we let them go on to California, they're going to raise hell in California, raise volunteers, and then we're going to have an army coming from California against us, and we will be slaughtered. So they make the horrible decision that they have to wipe out the witnesses, except for the 17 youngest children who were too young to tell tales. They should have figured out that if a company of 120 to 140 people doesn't show up in California, they just might be missed. Well, and they knew they would, they blamed it on Indians as well. So yeah. Okay. Um, thank you for coming tonight. Yeah. Thank you.